Hello to you, welcome to The Reality Show. So good to be with you once again. And right here on The Reality Show, we speak to people whose lives have been touched by the reality of Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says that the ways of man, our traditions and our laws and our regulations are about a shadow. The reality of real life can only be found in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. Today, we're going to be talking about what God can do with you to use the gifts that God has given you. I'm joined in the studio today by Pastor Peter Jenkins. And Peter's an amazing man of God. He's a pastor, he's a broadcaster, and in his words, he's a product of the 1904 Welsh Revival. Peter's also involved in emissions works in, in, in Philippines and other parts of the world. Peter, thank you for joining us on The Reality Show. It's my pleasure. It's nice to see you. Good to have you with us. Amazing stuff. Well, a product of the 1904 Welsh Revival. Tell I, us about I that. I grew up and all anybody ever spoke about was the Welsh Revival, which had happened, you know, 40 years before they were referring to it. My grandmother was an eight-year-old girl in the Welsh Revival. She lived in a place called Bedlinog. Now, I might start speaking with a bit of a Welsh accent because it was in Merthyr Tydfil, you see, <laughs> in South Wales. And when the Revival broke out, there were meetings every single night. You know, you didn't have a meeting once a week, every night. Miners came from the pit straight to the church. Wives often took their sandwiches to the church. They stayed all night and went back down the pit. It was just incredible. And it started with a handful of young people praying. We've got to get back to praying, you know. We are need it's a sad thing to me. Every Christian will say they believe in prayer, yet the prayer meeting is the least attended meeting in nearly every church I know. It doesn't make sense. So young people started to pray. Evan Roberts is a very well-documented thing that happened. And my grandmother wanted to go to one of the meetings. She was eight years of age. She went to the church at, well, a chapel, we call it in Wales. We have chapels. She went to the chapel, and the entrance to the chapel was a little sort of porch area with a stone cold floor. The deacon said, children are not allowed in here. The conviction of sin was so heavy, men were, were screaming out for mercy, Dudley. You know, we don't, we don't hear much about that these days. People want to be made to feel happy. They want motivation. They don't want a message. They want therapy. They don't want theology. That's where we go in today. It's a, it's a bit of a thing, but... So my grandmother said, well, can I just stay here in the entrance porch of the church? And the deacon said, as long as you don't make a noise. She's eight. She knelt on the... Um, I get tears in my eyes even thinking about it now. She knelt on the stone cold floor no coloring book, no toys, no dolls, no mobiles, nothing. And one hour later, she got up born again and served God till she died in her 90s. Wow, amazing, amazing. Totally amazing. And I say, Lord, do that again. Well, that's what we need. We don't need programmers. We, we need a move of the Holy Spirit. And without that, I don't see the way, with, I can't see how we can see a great change in our nation without a move of the Holy yeah, Spirit. Lord, do that again, absolutely. Move by your Holy Spirit. I'm gonna ask you a little bit about the Welsh Revival in a minute, but uh, she was your, your grandmother, your, your granny. Uh, did you know her? Sorry? Did you know her? Oh yeah. yes, of yeah. course, she okay. told me that story. That so came from she told her you mouth. The story, so she had an input into your life. So oh yeah, well you, I- my, How did you come to, come to know Jesus? My granddad, um, my, my father's mother died when, when she was um, having a, a baby. My dad was five. So my granddad remarried, so it was actually my step grand. But we grew up as a family and uh, she shared that story with me. She, she actually lived very close to Abavan. You remember what happened in Abavan when that mountain of mud came down and so many were, were killed, you know. She lived very close to that. And so I just heard these stories all the time. I mean, my granddad, when, when I was growing up, I didn't hear too many sort of nursery rhymes. He told me all about end time prophecy and things. And so I grew up just absolutely looking for the Bible to be fulfilled because that's everything that I ever heard about. He was a pastor. My uncle was a pastor. My cousin was a pastor. We had more pastors than an Italian restaurant. And I didn't want to be a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, yeah. Lovely stuff. <laughs> And so, uh, so she had an input into your life. How did, you, how did you actually come to that point when you said, I want some of that, I want to be a Christian? I was nine. I had to go to church. My dad was very strict. I grew up in a very strict sort of Welsh Valley Pentecostal environment. So 
Sunday was three times in church, right? Sunday, the Lord's Day actually was a day. Now it's 45 minutes, but that's another thing. So I had to go to church in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the night. I hated Sundays with a passion because I couldn't kick a football, I couldn't watch the television. That was it. And then he said, and you have to go once in the week. So I thought, if I go Monday night, then it's three times on a Sunday, Monday night, I go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday to myself. <laughs> this is how I worked it out, right? And my dad was a coal miner, with, and coal miners' hands are big, so the right hand of fellowship of my dad, you knew you'd receive the right hand of fellowship. So I went on a Monday night. Every Monday night, my uncle was the pastor of that church, so he would say, any prayer request? And a little nine-year-old boy would put up his hand. And every Monday night, it was a ritual, and the pastor would say, what can we pray for? And the little boy would say, I want to be a missionary. Seventy years later, Dudley, that prayer is still being answered. That's amazing. It amazing. is amazing. Praise God. We're going to talk about that mission work in just a minute, Peter. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the Welsh revival. You know, it was a long time ago. Um, how did it start? What was the effect? It started in a, it, it's, it's reported to have started in a place called Luffa, a little tiny chapel with a man called Evan Roberts, with a handful of young people, and they just had an encounter with Jesus. I haven't been to Bible school, but I do love Jesus. And <laughs> somebody said to me the other day, how do you keep your passion at your age, you know? And I thought about that, and there's only one way that that little nine-year-old boy is still serving Jesus at my age, which is a few years down the road, is because I love Jesus. And they had an encounter with Jesus which transformed them. You either love Jesus or you like him, but there's no, there's no room in between. And if you love him, you love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And I grew up in that environment of of hearing stories of what had happened, of miracles that had happened, of, of grown men just falling on the floor and the conviction, it was just like incredible stories, you know. And that, that had a massive effect on me because we started a church when I was 16, five of us. The oldest one was a man called Paul Mercy who was our youth leader and the rest of us were teenagers. I was 16. How can you start a church at 16? We didn't have a clue what we were doing. We had open air meetings. I played a trombone, somebody played a violin, somebody played a piano accordion, we had open airs. The noise was so bad that people used to come and find out what the noise was. And nobody ever said we come to find out what the music is. They came to find out what the noise was. Can you believe it? And as they came, every Tuesday night, we, we ended up with a congregation and we had no building. And it was, that was 1961 when, uh, when, when we, we started that church in open airs, we didn't know what we were doing, but we loved Jesus. <laughs> There's no substitute for loving Jesus. So if you're gonna use what you've got, then it, whatever you've got, it could be a couple of loaves and a few fish. But if you give it to Jesus, if you love Jesus and give him what you've got, you'll be amazed what he can do with it. I'm a living testimony to that. Absolutely, that's what we're talking about today, using what we've got. Uh, to serve the Lord. Uh, you mentioned earlier, you said, uh, you threw away a little statement uh, that today we're looking for um, therapy rather than theology. So uh, can we expect a revival like that today, no. Peter? No, because the Bible tells us that in the end times, Paul writes to Timothy, many will depart from, from the truth, from sound doctrine, and will go after teachers with itching ears, telling them what they want to hear. That's very much the culture we're living in. Now, people want to feel comfortable. They want to be happy. They want a massage. They don't want a message. They want to go home feeling happy, but don't preach about conviction and repentance because that doesn't make them feel too good. Um, I pray, God, send the Holy Spirit, and I don't put any conditions on that. Let God do what he wants to do, but without the Holy Spirit. Why did the Holy Spirit come? He came to convict convince and warn us of coming judgment. And so we need the Holy Spirit to reveal that to us more than ever, I really believe that. And he is called the Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's Sanctified, called the Holy Spirit. Perfect in every right, in every way. Um, uh, do you think that's missing a little bit in the church today, that holiness, that ethic of, of, of the principles because of God? Because we want to be so culturally relevant today. You hear this all the time, you know, the church must be culturally relevant. 
I do a Friday night and a Sunday night live stream on my Facebook. Um, and on a Friday we do Bible study. We do in the book of Revelation, 27th week we are in the book of Revelation. It's the most neglected book, but yet it tells us what's going to happen. How can we neglect the book that tells us what's going to happen? I don't know. And then on a Sunday night, I look at sort of prophecy update, how prophecy is being fulfilled today. Because there's two and a half thousand prophecies in the Bible, but 2,000 have been fulfilled, which means even in my maths, there's 500 to be fulfilled. And some of those are being fulfilled even now in the world that we are living in. So the Bible becomes alive, you know, when you see it as a living book. It's the Word of God, which, 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 which will endure forever. And my heart is saddened when leaders of some of the churches are trying to rewrite the Bible, change what the Bible says to suit the culture. That'll never work. Mm, absolutely not. So you gave your life to Jesus at age nine and you developed this passion for missions. You I did. eventually became a pastor. How did you get into the ministry, Peter? Well, let me just tell you something amazing had happened when my dad was dying. I never knew this until he came to the end of his life. He said, I've got something to tell you. My dad was a coal miner. My granddad was a pastor. My dad was a coal miner. He said, your grandmother, that's his mother who had died in childbirth when he was five, told her best friend she was going to die in childbirth. So her best friend said, don't say that. She said, I am, God's told me, so I want you to promise you look after my children. That best friend became my step grand as it happened, right? So my, my step grand said to my father's mother, my, my, my real grand, who I obviously never met, why are you saying that? She said, because God called me to the mission field and I never went. Something, when my dad told me that, I broke down crying. I never knew where my passion for missions came from, but somehow it was in my DNA. It was something that was in my DNA that I never knew about, I never understood. My pastor told me when I was about 12, because I was a pain, I'm, I, I admit it, I was a pain. <laughs> he said, Peter, I want a word with you. <laughs> I thought he was going to really encourage me. He said, if God can use you, he can use anybody. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> God has used yeah, you profoundly. True, it's true. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Peter, you, you started a, a church up in uh, Amblecote in the, in the West Midlands uh, here in Britain. Uh, you started with a handful of people, but it grew to a big church. Tell us about that. It was, an, um, it was amazing. I didn't want to move to the Midlands because we were born in Wales. My wife was Welsh. We, Carol became a Christian through the open airs we had, can you believe? And when I had this opportunity to move to the Midlands, which is an amazing story for, to work in the steel stockholding industry, I didn't want to go. So I said, okay, God, if we've got to go, sell our house. But you couldn't sell houses, so like, I thought, I'm safe. <laughs> that was Sunday afternoon, Monday night, knock on the door opened the door, a man said, I'd like to buy this house. There's no for sale sign. I don't know how much I want for it. I tried to put him off. I don't know how much I want for it. I might not move for a year. And everything he said, I'll wait, I'll pay whatever the price. You might not sell your house, I don't have one. You might not get a mortgage, it's a cash purchase. I thought, oh boy, God, why do you answer prayers? I want you to take a long time over, quick. <laughs> and why do, you <laughs> why do you take a long time when I want you to answer now? I don't get this. God's right. ways are not our ways, Peter. <laughs> so, so I came to the Midlands and I, I looked around looking for a church and I found this little church in a street called King William Street and the woman next door came out and I said what time are the services she said oh they're closing it down nobody comes here anymore Dudley I heard a voice that's why you've come what <laughs> I've come to this so I rung up Carol because we hadn't even moved to the Midlands. I was, I was staying in a hotel on my own. I didn't know anybody. I was Billy Nomitz, right? I knew nobody. And now I found this building, which is, it looked like a garage. And I've come for this. I rung up Carol. I said, I found the church. She said, how many young people are there? I said, it's a very bad line. And I put the phone down because they, they wouldn't. <laughs> I don't know. I said, God, you got me in this. Get me out of it, right? I was invited to the local Methodist church, youth club, just to share with the young people. The, the youth leader asked me to go. I went, give my testimony. Well, one of the leaders in the church, I don't want to be too specific, came across and says, what are you doing? I said, I'm telling them about Jesus. He said, we don't want you a sort here. I said, 
So I, I, I was a bit younger then, and I wasn't quite so diplomatic. <laughs> I said, so these kids want to talk about God, and you want to give them a table tennis bat, you know. He said, if you don't leave now, I'm fetching the police because you're trespassing. So I literally got thrown out of a church youth club for talking about Jesus, right? Okay. Story of my life, this is. So as I was thrown out, all the kids said, well, which chapel does he go to? Oh, it's that little one in Humble Court. Why don't we all go on Sunday? On Sunday, you couldn't believe what happened. The doors were kicked open. In came this <laughs> army of kids. Oh, bless them. And a lot of those are serving the Lord to this day. Praise God. That's Honestly, amazing. It's amazing. totally incredible. Praise God. So it started with a handful of kids. Um, I believe that uh, you preached the gospel and you saw people coming to salvation uh, for, for months and you saw the church growing phenomenally. And then, and then the, the salvation stopped. What was that? Story? Every single Sunday, people got saved. Yes. I got so arrogant, I actually thought, even if I didn't say, I know how to preach the gospel. I used to say to well, the pastors, does anybody get saved Sunday? No. And I used to think, what's wrong with you? Why aren't people getting saved? Every Sunday in Humble Court, people are coming to Christ. And then my granddad died. And people stopped getting saved. And I thought, why is that? And then I remembered. My granddad knew what time the meeting was every Sunday night. This, I'm so old I am that we used to have gospel meetings every Sunday night. Churches don't have those very often. Every Sunday we had gospel meetings which grew and grew and grew. My granddad knew what time the meeting was. He knew what time I'd make the altar call. My granddad, confined to bed for the last few years of his life, was praying, mate. And when he died, people stopped getting saved for about three months because God had to teach me a lesson. It wasn't my preaching. It was my granddad's prayers. His prayers. I call that prayer evangelism. Oh, yeah. yeah. I have a, a list uh, with names on it. I call it my EPL, my evangelism prayer list. Yeah. How important is prayer in evangelism? Totally. It's, we need, it's, the great, it's the most neglected thing. We don't have time to pray. But I am genuinely spending more time praying, and I'm also learning to pray a little bit more like Jesus. What do I mean by that? He submitted his will to his Father, not my will. I've got my bucket list. I hear all this demanding and declaring and decreeing. I don't do any of that. I bring my request to him and then I submit my prayers to God and pray, let your will be done. And I feel I just got so much peace in that. Mm -hmm. I really have. But you can't pray too much. That's a sure fact. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Jesus said, uh, none can come to me unless the Father draws them to him. Uh, so when we pray, we need to pray that God will draw people uh, to Christ. Absolutely. I can't pray for somebody's evangelism because evangelism, I'm sorry, I can't pray for somebody's salvation because their salvation has already been done yeah. 2,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah. They've got to appropriate it. Yeah, of course. They're yeah. pray the Lord will draw them to Jesus. That's powerful stuff. Peter, then you uh, got involved in, in broadcasting, radio broadcasting. We're on telly now, but you, you've done a bunch of radio. Tell us That's about that. That's where we met. That's where we met. That's where we met. I think I had black hair then. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was a few years ago. <laughs> it was a few years ago. That was a good time though, really. So t tell us about it. What, what were you doing? Well, my involvement was I was so privileged to, uh, to meet a guy called Danny Charanji, who we, we together run a, a church Today in West Bromwich, it's a bilingual Asian church. And Danny's background is amazing in the, in the Asian world, in music and so on. And he was called of God to leave a very, very lucrative job with the BBC and to come and work in broadcasting, using all of his skills. And so we launched the, the TVA, the Voice Asia, which was reaching out to all of Southeast Asia. And so it was my privilege to be the chaplain of that station. and and. Uh, I've learned to love Indian food <laughs> and I've learned to love Indian people. Well, Asian people, not just Indian people. I've learned God's given me a real love for them. And we saw some amazing things happen there. Yeah. We really did, you know. Fantastic. We saw people get it. One man was blind and the presenter 
tells him over the radio, put your hand on your eyes and pray. And God healed him of blindness, mate. I mean, it's so astounding. We can hardly believe it ourselves. I had, when I went to India, I had to meet him to make sure, right, that it had actually happened because that's where we are, isn't it? We get surprised when God answers prayer. Yeah, yeah. Phenomenal stuff. Phenomenal. Nice it was stuff. truly. You know. We've talked about uh, using what God has given us to use, you know, for his, his kingdom. Uh, Peter, you've used right from the age of nine, been using what God has given you. Uh, he's given you the ability to orate, to speak uh, and, and to tell stories, which is phenomenal. Uh, so anybody, perhaps uh, if you could just take a minute now just to, to speak to our viewer uh, and encourage him or her to use what God has given them to serve the Lord. Yeah, whatever it is, don't despise it. You know, the devil will tell you you're nobody, but God says you're somebody. And what I've, what I've just been reminded of, and I have to say this, I said to the Lord one day, why is one soul worth more to you than the entire universe? I'm driving my car and the Lord spoke to me and said, because when I said, let there be light, and he traveled at 186,000 miles a second, the batteries of heaven did not run down. It demonstrated my power. When I put all the stars in space, billions and billions of stars, it demonstrated my power. Didn't cost me anything. But to save your soul cost me everything. And so God can you, there's 6,000 million people in the world. Do you know what? There's 6,000 million ways to Jesus because your testimony, my testimony, every person's testimony watching this program is different. How has God come up with 6,000 million variations of fingerprints? How has he come up with 6,000 million ways for you to come to Jesus? It's an amazing, there's only one way to God, but nobody's got the same testimony as how they came to Jesus. It's miraculous. And God can use you in a way you could never expect to be a catalyst, to be a link in bringing somebody to Jesus. It's just incredible. It is. And to use those talents that God has given you, you know, whether it's uh, uh, making samosas, Indian <laughs> samosas that you love so much. Whether it's playing <laughs> a trombone. Which, making, you know, a, making a pot roast or playing a trombone. You know, do what God has called us whatever to do. Whatever it is, yeah. whatever it is, do it as unto the Lord and yeah. be your best at it. You know, very often I know in employment situations, Christians haven't always had the best testimony in the workplace. That's wrong. You should be the best person on the shop floor. Yeah. You should make the best cup of tea because that's the way we show other people the difference Jesus makes in our lives, by doing your best. Whatever it is, do your best and leave the results with God and you'll be surprised what will happen. Fantastic. Peter, for two minutes, tell us your funniest story in ministry. Oh, my funniest story. I, I've, <laughs> I've got so many funny stories, I, I wouldn't even know where to start, really. But I think it's fair to say that I had a dream. And I had, in my dream, I was walking up a step, and uh, this step was in a field. It was surrounded by faces that weren't white. I don't know where it was. I had the dream five times. I waited 25 years for the dream to come true. I was invited to go to the Philippines. I go to the Philippines. I'm taken into the jungle. Um, I met a guy who I've never knew in my life, 9,000 miles away. This is what God does, right? Take me into the jungle. And I stand up to preach in the jungle, in a field, full of the entire village had turned out. This has never happened before, ever in the history of that village. And as I stood up to preach, the PA blew up, all the lights went off, and we're absolutely stuck in the dark, right? So I'm inviting people to come to Jesus. But it's no good saying, raise your hands. <laughs> so I'm saying, if you... <laughs> I'm laughing now. If you want to receive Jesus, let me see your teeth. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Look at all these smiles. <laughs> I, I, uh, nobody's ever made an appeal like that before. But if you're in the dark, pitch black, you can't see a thing, right? And there's people who want to receive the Lord, so just smile and let me see your teeth. I can see those teeth. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, all heads are bowed and eyes are closed and mouths are open. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. Fantastic. Amazing. So you've had uh, good results in, in ministry in, in the Philippines? Oh, yeah, we've gone back in October. Um, we, we've got about 20 churches we relate to in the Philippines, all down the south. We don't do work in Manila. A lot of the big ministries are there. This is on the islands. And uh, it's just an amazing thing. I've found that sometimes people that have the least are the happiest. It's a strange thing, isn't it? And they learn to trust God in ways that, that I haven't yet, you know. We had a flat tire in the middle of a field, in the middle of nowhere. There's no AA, there's no jack, there's no spare tire. And the kids say, well, let's pray. What's the point of praying over a flat tire? 
A car turns up from the... It could have dropped off another planet. I don't know where this car came from. Who happened to have a jack? And then I thought, well, it's not called jacking it up because the tail will go down. Not the kids. The kids said, pump it up in Jesus' name. It stayed up and we, were, we drove home. <laughs> How does it work? I That's don't amazing. know. That's amazing. It amazing. Is. So you're still travelling out to, to the Philippines? You're still doing some work? In October, then? yeah. Well, God, uh, oh, you said you had a passion to be a missionary. So you're a pastor and a missionary. Take well, a yeah. I, far I, reaches of the globe. But remember this, you know, and I say this to people, that the light that shines furthest afield burns brightest at home, OK? You don't have to cross the sea to be a missionary. Just cross the street. Just knock next door. Uh, there's a mission field all around us. There really is. The mission field starts at your front door. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So what are your plans for the future, Peter? Well, we're obviously, I'm working in the, I'm very involved in a church in South Wales in, called Victory Church in Cumbran with Clyde Thomas. We run rehabs there for ex-offenders and drug addicts and the testimonies are there. Some of those testimonies you've got to get because I tell you what, without Jesus, they'd be dead. And there's no doubt about that. It is absolutely incredible what God is doing in their lives. And for somebody like me that's come from quite a stable background, a good solid family background, to meet guys like this is so humbling, you know, because what Jesus is doing in their lives at Dudley is miraculous. It's called Hope Centre Ministries. And if anyone knows anyone that's got a, a drug problem, get in touch with us because we can help you then. Absolutely. On that note, uh, I'd like to give you my personal email address. If you'd like to make contact with Peter, please drop me a note. It's dudley at surereality.net. Peter, it's been fantastic speaking to you. Thank you so much for joining us on The Reality Show. My privilege, thank you. You know, we've been talking about uh, using what God has given us uh, for his purposes, for his kingdom. Uh, God has given you talents, he's given you abilities. Jesus taught a parable on talents. Now, biblically speaking, a talent was a currency of money, but I don't believe it is a coincidence that it means a gift or a talent in our day and age. And the Lord has called you to use those gifts for the kingdom of God, to give it all you've, you've got. God is calling us to, uh, to serve him, to do all that we do with all our might. That is excellence. God has called you to be all that you are and not more than you are. You can't be more than you are, but you can indeed be all that God has called you to do and to be. So if you've got a gift, perhaps it's making food, perhaps it's making music, use it for the kingdom of God. Thank you so much for your time. Once again, that email address, dudley at surereality.net. I'd love to hear from you. Till next time, God bless you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Take care now.